Hello YouTube! Welcome again to another one of my pre-release guides. As promised, I'm back again with even more videos for the upcoming patch. Today we'll be looking at the new Quantum 4-star Abundance character, Lynx. So let's dive right into it. These are going to be Lynx's base stats at level 80. She has the lowest base HP among all the current Abundance characters, but she has the highest base defense. This makes her more tanky, but will provide slightly less heals as her healing scales off of HP. As for her speed, she has 1 speed point less than Luocho, but 2 higher than Bailu and Natasha, putting her at a very good spot. The max energy cost is 100, which is the same as Luocha and Bailu, making it possible to get her ult up every 3 turns with specific gear and or situations. Coming to her basic attack, this in fact scales with her HP, making the damage more meaningful, but it's not enough to make her deal a considerable amount of damage. Her skill will heal a single target ally based on her own HP, and she also applies the survival response effect on that ally for 2 turns. When this effect is active on an ally, it increases their max HP, and if they follow the path of destruction or preservation, they receive an increase in their own taunt value by 500%, which is the same aggro that you get from using March skill. With this, a destruction unit goes from 125 to 750 taunt value, and a preservation unit goes from 150 to 900 taunt value, assuming no other taunt value alterations. So, if you have a team consisting of Lynx, Blade, who is a destruction character, and then the other two being either Harmony or Nihility, Blade will have a 29.4% chance to be targeted by the enemy. Now, Blade with Survival Response will have 71.4% probability to be attacked, making that about 2.4 times as more likely. To put all that together, her skill heals, increases max HP, and increases taunt value. Do note that the skill does not cleanse. I'm emphasizing this because many are used to Natasha and Luocho. Next up, her ultimate heals all allies based on her own HP and at the same time it provides a party-wide cleanse where it removes one debuff from all allies. This is the most unique part about her kit which no other character provides right now. Her talent provides the continuous healing effect to the healed ally from either skill or ult for two turns. This provides additional healing to the allies with the survival response effect. For level up priority, try to get everything except basics up to 8 with a focus on talent and ult before skill. Feel free to level up the basics if you would like as it scales with her HP, but it is not as important. Leveling her traces will not cost you much as she is a 4 star unit. As for her traces, from her Ascension 2 trace, she regenerates 2 energy when an ally with survival response is hit. She can proc this any number of times within 2 turns of having the survival response effect on an ally. Her Ascension 4 trace grants her CC resist by 35%, which is vital for a sustained unit. This only applies to Frozen, Entanglement, Imprisonment, Outrage, and Domination currently. Then, her final ascension trace makes it so that the continuous healing effect from the talent will last an extra turn, making it 3 turns now. When you unlock all the traces, you receive a total of 28% HP, 22.5% defense, and 10% effect rest. Finally, using her technique will grant the continuous healing effect to all allies for 2 turns. This will actually be 3 turns due to the bonus ability from one of her ascension traces. She honestly looks like a very very solid unit just at E0. Her ult is a unique full team cleanse and I can see this being very useful in some situations that I have come across thus far, which I'll talk about later. Her skill increases max HP and taunt value which is a notable increase in damage for current destruction characters and very plausibly future ones as well. The fact that her talent provides continuous healing to all allies upon casting her ult is massive. Then there is the CC resist and energy gain from the ascension traces. She definitely feels like a pseudo 5 star abundance unit that almost does it all but we'll see if the numbers live up to that. Lynx is a healer with HP scaling. You're just looking for sets that boost these and speed as well. Currently, there's no absolute go-to for 4 piece relic set for her. Although there's three that I would like to mention. Firstly, there's the 4 piece messenger set. 
Personally, I like the two-piece set, but not the four-piece, as it doesn't affect your action values by a considerable amount to justify running it. Also, you may not always ult when you have it in order to get the maximum value out of the four-piece. The same goes for four-piece wind. It gives a lot of effective speed to your links, but you may not be ulting as soon as you have it available. Finally, we have the four-piece passerby. The extra skill point at the start could actually make a difference. This especially can be noticed in SP hungry teams. So this goes for Ronya teams, Isle, Silo, Kafka teams, and possibly more in the future. So it's definitely an option that you could consider. For two-piece plus two-piece sets, you could totally go for any combination out of the HP set, the speed set, and the passerby set. I personally think going for the two-piece passerby is the most valuable one as it gives outgoing healing, which cannot be obtained as a substat. For the other two-piece, you can choose between speed and HP depending on substats and your needs. Both speed and HP are in the same domain, making it efficient to farm and decide which one to put on. As for the planar sets, you can choose between fleet and keel. If you're running a dot team, go fleet. If your damage healer wants crit damage, go for keel. Heal also provides you 10% of factors, which is very valuable for solo sustain. Moving on to the main stats, you want to go outgoing healing for the body as it simply provides more healing to your team than when you're running HP%, percent. but if you have no luck with getting one, you can go HP%. Percent. For boots, speed is unfortunately the only option. You can even break 2p's or 4p's effects just to go speed boots. Sphere you want to go HP% percent, and Rope can be either ER or HP. The comparison for this is right before the light cone section. For substats, aim for Effectra, Speed, and HP%. Percent. Flat HP is fine as well and defense rolls provide some personal survivability. I'd like to point out that Speed is statistically the rarest substat to get on your relics, so if you already managed to get HP% percent and Effectra substats on your 4-piece wind, you can definitely stick with it. If you're starting from scratch, I'd recommend hitting the two-piece passerby domain and the speed plus HP domain. I'll now explain about effectors and speed to have a better understanding as to how important these could be. Effectors will matter a lot when solo sustaining. The last thing you want is your healer or cleanser on the team to get CC'd. The game is still fairly new, so you can expect the enemies to get more and more annoying with their debuffs, making effectors indispensable on your sustains. So the question is how much do you need? Let's take an example of Kafka's domination. At level 90, her domination has 120% base chance with 32% effect hit rate. For a Luocha with his final trace and 30% effectors, he still has a 33.2% chance to get dominated. Links with her CC resist trace will require 68% of factors in order to provide the same odds. If we are assuming non-CC debuffs, then stacking up a factors becomes a lot more significant. For example, Frigid Prowler has a 100% base chance to deep freeze all allies with 32% effect hit rate. This is a debuff that stays on you until the end of the battle unless and until cleansed. You can see why Lynx is the perfect unit to counter this. In this case, with 68% of factors, you still have a 42.2% chance to get debuffed. At 81%, it comes down to 25%. Notice how much of a difference it is if you keep stacking up effectors. Ideally, you want to be as close to 100% as possible. I know this is a lot, but this is what endgame sustains would look like if they don't have any crazy amount of built-in effectors or a way to counter any debuff more feasibly. You get 10% of factors from traces, 10% from keel, 16% from S1 perfect timing, putting you at 36% without considering substats. I'd say it's fairly easy to get to the 60-70% to range if you are investing well enough. Min-maxing will get you closer and of course it is a lot easier with superimpositions on perfect timing. For now, I suggest getting as much as you can only if you're planning to go solo sustain. People say it's better to build as much speed as you can on your supports to generate skill points. While this is true for Harmony and Nihility, you most likely don't need so much speed on specifically your sustain. Harmony and Nihility want to buff your DPS damage by going before the DPS. Unlike them, sustain units don't really need to do this. To put it briefly, if your team is skill point hungry, you may need your sustain to be faster than your DPS. So this may be true for Branya teams, Isle, Sila, Kafka teams, and so on. Otherwise, a Lynx with fully leveled speed boots at 125 speed will suffice. Assuming your DPS finishes a wave in 6 actions with 134 speed, Lynx with 135 speed will also have 6 actions. 
If your Lynx is at 133 speed, which is 1 speed lower than your DPS, she will have 5 actions. So you're missing out on just 1 action on your sustain per wave. With 134 speed DPS and 135 to 153 speed sustain, the rotation will perform the same, making almost 20 excess speed redundant. Lapping your DPS is very expensive and not worth it. So you don't need to aim for very high speed. Now let's look at it with enemies in the picture. Most elites and bosses are at 158 speed, so they get to act twice before your sustain gets another action in the third cycle if your sustain is at 125 speed. You will most likely end up breaking the enemy at this point or even earlier, delaying their action by 25%, and you delay your enemy even more if you break with ice, imaginary, or quantum. So this may not even be an issue. The point I'm trying to make is in skill point positive teams, focus more on building effect res and substats over any speed if you don't need that one extra action per wave on your sustain as effect res is simply more valuable. With HP rope, you can do 4 turn ults, and with ER rope, you get closer to 3 turn ults. In my opinion, ulting even 1 turn faster is more ideal as it means you have better healing up time and also better cleanse up time. With 3 turn ults, you basically have the continuous healing effect every turn for every ally, except for some super high speed characters like Ting Yun or those that get advanced forward by Bronya. The ER rope will provide you 3 turn ults with 1 skill and 2 basics, assuming no hits if you proc her ascension trays at least twice with S1 post op. Other super impositions are as shown here. If we are assuming getting 10 energy from getting hit 1 time over 3 turns, then you don't even need post op. So you can get away without using post op when facing enemies that do AoE and blast attacks constantly. Also, you can do 2 skills plus 1 basic on any LC with just the ER rope to get 3 turn ults. If you feel that you don't need to do 3 turn ults, you can stick with HP rope. For 5 star light cones, the Luocha one gives you attack which doesn't help links at all. It can be conditionally useful for the energy and speed gain. It also has a decent base HP but it's nothing great. The Bailu Light Cone has slightly higher base HP and it increases HP% percent and healing boost. This LC also gives you some damage but it's nothing significant. For 4 star options we have Post Stop. It increases ER and outgoing healing but only for the ult. Then there's Perfect Timing which increases effect res and like we talked, this stat is very important. At the same time you get a healing boost for your skill, ult and continuous healing which is amazing. If you'd like to know how much effect res you need for a specific superimposition of perfect timing, just divide outgoing healing by the other number. Quid Pro Quo is a nice F2P option as you can buy this for max superimposition from the MOC shop. I'm not a fan of Shared Feeling and the Battle Pass Light Cone. Their effects don't feel as impressive as others. The 3 star Light Cones for Abundance actually have the same base HP as perfect timing and Quid Pro Quo. You can definitely go with S5 Carnucopia over S5 Quid Pro Quo depending on your needs. S5 Multiplication is also something you could consider. Overall, I'd say Post Hop is the most consistent option for 3 turn ults, but if you're up against content where you get hit easily, you could go Perfect Timing, Bailu LC, or Carnucopia. Personally, I'll be switching between Perfect Timing and Post Hop with an ER rope. Let's assume a level 80 Lynx with a level 80 Light Cone. I'll also be considering level 10 Traces as getting 3 Traces to level 10 on her is cheaper than getting 2 Traces to level 10 on a 5 star unit. You can see the healing amounts for different Light Cones. Bailu's Light Cone will provide the best healing overall, Cornucopia will provide the best healing on skill and ult, Post Op and Perfect Timing may not provide the same level of healing but they provide better utility. Her healing looks similar to Natasha, but you can get a max HP boost and also the continuous healing effect on everyone with an ult, making her a lot stronger. Well, she is a sustain unit, meaning you can put her in any team and she will work. The skill, however, gives increased aggro for destruction characters. This works well with Clara and Blade. You may need to use skill more often on links with both of these characters depending on how much they get hit or consume HP. Both of these are not skill point intensive, allowing links to spam her skill. Blade also benefits from the max HP increase for more damage. Up next is Mono Quantum with Sila or QQ, Silver Wolf, Lynx, and Fushun. 
This team can comfortably clear any content except when the enemy has innate 40 to 60% quantum resistance. We don't have that currently in the game with the exception of the doomsday boss, but more enemies like this will pop up in the future. This team is not going to be crazy by any means in terms of damage as you're occupying two slots for sustain. This will however change with Hanabi in the future. Her E1 gives healing boost of 20% when healing allies less than or equal to 50% HP, and this also works on her continuous healing. This can be very good for solo sustain when you take an AoE hit from the enemy and then you heal with your ult or continuous healing on your allies. E2 makes it so her skill now also provides immunity to any debuff for one time. This is really nice to prevent your ally from getting CC'd or even from non-CC debuffs. Since you boost aggro for destruction characters, you can use this tactically to your advantage. E3 increases her skill level by 2 and basic attack level by 1. E4 gives the ally with survival response an attack buff that is equal to 3% of her max HP for one turn. If Lynx has 5k HP, this translates to an attack boost of 150. This is purely an attack buff and honestly it isn't that much and it only lasts for one turn. E5 boosts her ult and talent levels by 2. E6 gives a further max HP increase from her skill to the target ally and increases their effect res by 30%. Let's take a look at how she performs against certain enemies. There's three major situations that I can think of where Lynx excels over any other sustain with Fushuan included, as I'm talking about non-CC debuffs. First is the Ascended Lady that decreases the entire team's recoverable HP. You can cleanse this entirely with an ult from Lynx. Second is the Frigid Prowler that I talked about earlier. He applies an everlasting debuff that reduces your ice res and speed that stacks up to three times. Lynx again can cleanse this off with one ult. Third one is the Stormbringer enemy who locks onto targets with one fear and if you cleanse all allies, it won't even cast its ability to deal damage. Other situations include AoE dot on your team, defense reduction debuffs, and so on. Obviously, things are not going to be perfect all the time and there may be emergency situations where you will not have your ult up in order to cleanse or just heal in general. To summarize, these are her pros and cons. So overall, she is a great pull at even E0. The pros speak for themselves. On my own account, I have all the possible sustain units so far, but I didn't build them quite well. I've been waiting for Lynx to come out so I can use her instead. She will mostly be fine and solo sustaining the team as long as you are bringing the weakness matching element so you do good enough damage and break with your DPS. It will get a lot tougher to survive if you are brute forcing content. And that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you all for the support and feedback on my previous video. I really really appreciate that because this does eat up a lot of my time and effort so I'm glad that it's being received well. I'm looking forward to doing more of these pre-release guides and the characters themselves. I'll be following up with a Fushuan guide as well very very soon so keep an eye on that. So I'll see you guys on the next one then. Peace!